January 1920, the 18th Amendment goes into effect outlawing the consumption of alcohol in the United States, right? Well, not exactly. Hi, I'm Justin Dodd, and this is Mental Floss on YouTube, from the couch. Prohibition actually just banned the production and sale of alcohol, not its consumption, which led some Americans to stockpile booze between the amendment's ratification in 1919 and its enforcement in 1920. Ken Burns' Prohibition documentary tells the story of New York's Yale Club, which reportedly amassed enough alcohol in that one-year grace period to comfortably see itself through the 13 years National Prohibition remained in effect. And that is just the first misconception about the 1920s that I'm excited to share with you today. That's right, misconceptions are back and they are wronger than ever. Okay, I mean, they're probably just equally wrong. I mean, semantically, you can't be more wrong. You know, you get it. Let's do this. Real quick, just wanted to address a few things. We are thrilled to be relaunching one of our favorite series, Misconceptions, although obviously this isn't exactly how we plan to do it. With everyone here working from home, we're doing our best to keep the videos coming without putting anyone at risk. That's why for now, I will be your host, camera person, set decorator, editor, and stage mom for this series. I hope you'll enjoy what we're making, and I can honestly say that having an audience to make stuff for is one thing that we are very grateful for as we try to figure out this temporary new normal. Now, let's go back to a time when the frightening spread of infectious disease and rampant economic uncertainty were non-issues. The 1920s. Car ownership in America skyrocketed in the 1920s, growing from 7.5 million registered vehicles in 1919 to 26 million by 1929. Almost half the cars purchased between 1920 and 26 were Model Ts. Savvy history buffs know that Henry Ford didn't invent the car, he just invented the assembly line. Even savvier enthusiasts know that that is also a misconception. Ford didn't invent the assembly line either. The division of specialized labor predates Ford by many years, and even in the automobile industry, Ransom E. Olds is generally credited as developing an assembly line process in 1902, when his refinements to the production process enabled Detroit's Olds Motor Works to increase their annual automobile output by over 400% from the year before. Ford's actual contribution was using a moving assembly line to build cars, employing what was basically a series of conveyor belts to greatly increase production efficiency. Ford and his team were inspired by disassembly lines already in use in the slaughterhouses of the Midwest, wherein animal carcasses were put on meat hooks and moved from station to station to cut off different cuts of meat. Just reverse the order, swap out a side of beef for a chassis, and you've got yourself the makings of one of the most successful businesses of the 1900s. You can't talk about the 1920s without talking about flappers, and luckily there are plenty of misconceptions about this renegade historical archetype. First of all, women weren't just rebelling in the United States. Germany's new women gained suffrage after World War I and instigated conversations around sexuality and gender roles. Japan's modern girls saw a rise in women working outside of the house and living on their own and France's new women, sometimes called garçons, fomented similar social change and pushed women's fashion in an androgynous direction, influencing styles abroad. Flappers were no exception. If you look at photos from the time, you might be struck by the styles of the day, modest by contemporary standards, and at times even a bit boyish. The dresses were shorter than was typical in prior years, but they still usually came down to at least the knee. If you picture something shorter than that in your mind, it's probably due to conceptions of the style created well after the 20s, in fashion and film. And according to Beverly Burks, a vintage dealer and exhibition curator, fringe was not the most common thing you saw in the 1920s. That would be beadwork or embroidery. Fringe became more popular in later years, once it could be mass produced as a lightweight synthetic. Which means Baz Luhrmann's Great Gatsby isn't always historically accurate. Huh. But Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, which is set in California, 100% historically accurate. In the world of sports, 1925 gave us the legend of Wally Pipp, the New York Yankee who sat out sick with a headache one day, only to be replaced by a promising young player named Lou Gehrig. Gehrig went on to baseball immortality and Pipp never reclaimed his starting role. Even today, when an athlete loses his place on a team due to injury, he is said to have been pipped. Now, it's worth pointing out here that there was a similar usage of the word Pipp that actually predates Wally entirely. The Oxford English Dictionary tells us that to pip meant to reject or disqualify by the early 20th century, as in the horse racing inspired expression, pipped at the post, meaning to fail after coming very close to achieving one's goal. 
but whether this is just the coincidence or an instance of one expression leading to the other, it's clear that many modern sports writers are thinking of the first baseman when they describe a modern athlete as being Wally Pipped after losing his job due to injury. The only problem? Contemporary accounts of Pip's benching don't mention an injury at all. He was apparently struggling to hit at the time, and the Yankees were facing a left-handed pitcher. The New York Sun said, Pip is notoriously weak batting against lefties, and lately, his hitting has been scant against all varieties of slinging, which, first of all, harsh, and the story of Pip's headache didn't appear until 1939, and even then, it's hopelessly convoluted. Some stories included Pip taking a ball to the head, leading to the headaches and double vision, but accounts of the beaning match up with an event that took place a month after the supposed headache-induced benching. In all likelihood, Pip didn't lose his job because of any one event or headache. He was just a declining player with a once-in-a-generation talent coming up behind him. Perhaps, in the end, it's the inexorable march of time that truly pips us all. On the subject of people replacing other people, it's a misconception that Woodrow Wilson was president of the United States in 1920. Okay, not exactly, but hear me out. In October 1919, Wilson suffered a stroke, leaving him paralyzed on the left side of his body and confined to bed. It's difficult to know how severely his abilities were limited in the year and a half that remained of his presidency, but what's clear is that his wife Edith took on a self-proclaimed role as Woodrow's steward and acted as the sole conduit between him and his cabinet. In her memoir, Edith Wilson claimed she never made a single decision regarding the disposition of public affairs during this period. But some modern day historians remain unconvinced of her version of events. While it is probably going too far to claim, as some sources have, that Edith was America's first female president, it seems fair to say that Woodrow was unable to perform many of his presidential duties for at least part of 1920. Now, moving from a disputed case of responsibility to a disputed case of responsibility. It's a misconception that Walt Disney invented Mickey Mouse with 1928 Steamboat Willie. First of all, Mickey had already appeared in an animated short months before called Plain Crazy, though it was screened only for limited audiences. Steamboat Willie's distinction is being the first Mickey cartoon with synchronized sound. More importantly, Mickey was actually co-created with animator Oob Iwerks, who was the man primarily responsible for Mickey's initial design. The collaborator's relationship eventually frayed, and Iwerks left to start his own studio in 1930. Disney began sharing different versions of Mickey's conception, which all featured him alone as the creative source behind the lovable rodent. Shady business from Walt, though I have to admit I can't imagine anyone poning up $7 a month for iWorks Plus. Let's end in 1929 with the infamous stock market crash that supposedly caused the Great Depression. Of course, the show isn't called Accurate Historical Beliefs, and it's really a misconception to say that the market crash caused the Depression. Most modern economists say that the crash was just as much a symptom of a failing economy as it was a contributing factor to that failure. Other factors that likely contributed to the depression included tariffs that hindered international trade, Germany, France, and Britain temporarily returning to the gold standard, and decreased economic activity as a result of the Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes. My personal Great Depression is caused by chemical imbalance and Germany returning to the gold standard. If you have a topic whose misconceptions you'd like to see us debunk, let us know in the comments. And if you're happy to see misconceptions come back, we wouldn't mind hearing about that either. Thank you for watching. I'm gonna go do a lap around the apartment, get the blood flowing. <laughs>